Drawing the eye is unique to itself in its collection of shapes, values, and colors. And if that wasn't difficult enough, as the old saying goes, the eye is the window to the soul. That really ups the intimidation factor, don't you think? So then, how do we draw something with so much visual complexity while at the same time trying to capture the essence of someone's spirit via charcoal, ink, or paint? By starting with the basics. The eye is a sphere or a ball with both volume and dimension. Composing the eyeball is the sclera or the white of the eye, the iris or the colored portion of the eye, and the pupil or the aperture to our camera. And from the side, we can clearly see the cornea, or the convex protecting window that slightly protrudes forward from the eyeball. Now this does fluctuate with age, but for most adults, the iris is in between one-third to one-half of the total height to width of the eyeball. And within the iris, the ratio of the pupil can be averaged into thirds, but that also changes dramatically as we'll explore. The simplified value range of the eye sees lights to midtones in the sclera, midtones to darks in the iris, and black for the pupil. The overall value of the iris ranges depending on the color of the eye. Odie, <laughs> get out of the shot, come on. Let's go, buddy. Hey there, Scully, I could really use your help with this section. We had mentioned earlier that the size of the pupil actually changes depending on the amount of light in the environment. The less light in the environment, the bigger the pupil gets, and the brighter the environment is, the smaller the pupil becomes. Now Scully, can you look to your left for us? Cool. Now can you look to your right? Thanks. Again, since the eye is a ball or a sphere, as the eye turns, the shape of the iris and the pupil change with their new perspective, becoming more narrow the further they turn from center. Right, of course, I bet that's really weird. In order to properly understand the eyelids, let's build out starting with the bony foundations of the skull. The eyeball rests in the eye socket, composed of the frontal bone, the zygomatic arch, and the maxilla. Resting on top of the eye in those bony masses is the orbicularis oculi, or the muscles that construct both the upper and lower lids. This provides the framing to the window of the eye. Let's take a closer look at this opening. First, note the difference at either side. The inside corner toward the nose is notched like a U. This is the boundary for the tear duct. Meanwhile, the outside corner is shaped more like a Y created from the slight overlap of the upper lid on top of the lower lid. Sandwiched between are five subtle yet very distinct planes of the eye opening. Three planes defining the upper lid, and another two planes creating the lower lid. The highest point on the upper lid and the lowest point on the lower lid are rarely on center. Rather, it is much more common to find the highest point closer to the inner third and the lowest point closer to the outer third of the eye. This creates a lovely diagonal rhythm leading to the upper inside to lower outside. When we close our eye or blink, the majority of the movement is made from the upper lid. This causes an asymmetrical balance in the height of the eye opening. Thus, the lower lid tends to only be about a third of the overall height, while the upper lid can measure about two thirds of the height of the eye opening. More often than not, the outer corner is slightly higher than the inner tear duct. Always make sure to reference the corner symmetry and alignment. Now let's land the eye opening on the eyeball itself. The opening extends almost the entire width of the eyeball, just resting on the inside of either edge. Typically in a relaxed state, looking forward, the top one-fifth of the iris is usually covered by the upper lid while the bottom of the iris just tickles the lower lid. Remember, the eyeball is not flat and two-dimensional. It is a three-dimensional sphere. The exaggeration of this asymmetrical subtlety allows the artist to successfully land the eye opening on the form of the eyeball. And oppositely, the more the artist draws parallel symmetry and even alignments, 
the more they create the iconic almond shape, thus ignoring any subtle asymmetrical alignments and flattening out any possible three-dimensional illusion. Bummer! Back to the eyelids in full. Again, the abicularis oculi defines both the upper and lower lid. The upper lid follows the planes of the upper opening, arching again around the highest point toward the inner third, creating three subtle yet distinct segments. Meanwhile, the lower lid rounds the lower opening, much softer and not near as geometric. But just like the planes of the lower eye opening, the lower lid's lowest part tends to be toward the outer corner of the eye. On to the side of the eye. As we've mentioned earlier, because the majority of the movement is made by the upper lid, typically the upper lid pushes notably forward beyond the lower lid. This asymmetry creates a downward diagonal shift inwards from the top lid to the lower lid. And just like the balance of the almond eye, we again want to stay away from any kind of symmetry. The opening of the eye is actually quite narrow from the side. Thus, the more you stretch it out, the more flat and unrealistic it will look. Both the upper and lower lids have volume and dimension. The upper lid has a top plane and a descending side plane showing its thickness. The same goes for the lower lid, as it also showcases its thickness with a noticeable top plane. Another note, be it more subtle, but the cornea of the eye does push into the boundary of the eyelid, causing a slight convex impression. There are always variations in the eyelid structure, notably the presence of the epicanthal fold. This fold of skin angles over the inner upper eyelid. It is commonly seen in people of Asian descent, and it can also be seen in certain genetic conditions. Full folds cover most of the upper eyelid, while partial folds mainly just cover the inner eye. Eyes without this fold showcase a clear presence of the upper lid, noting two lid creases. Now that we've diagrammed the upper and lower lids and how they frame in the eye opening, let's look to how the eye socket frames in the eyeball. The eye socket being more of a rounded square is assembled by five distinct planes. And just like the opening of the eye, there are three arching planes constructing the top and two rounding planes defining the bottom. The three upper planes of the eye socket are virtual extensions of the upper three planes of the lid. Again, peeking around the inner third. However, when we draw the flesh, we typically encounter the eyebrow. So we just extend the skeletal framing of the planes upward to land underneath the brow. This gives you a clear and defined mapping of the eye socket for when drawing. When landing the eye within the eye socket, use the bones of the brow and the nose for alignment. Starting with the glabella, or the bone between the eyebrows. Use the base of the bone where it meets the top of the nose as a horizontal alignment, either aligning to the top of the upper lid or the base of the upper lid. Then sight the upper edge of this bone. Typically that aligns to the inside edge of the eyebrow to land the inside of the eye within the socket. Or you can use the edge of the nostril. I would recommend both. Now back to the nose. Use the bottom plane of the nasal bone to map in the lower lid. The nasal bone creates the bridge or the bump on the nose. Let's draw, putting all of this together. Starting with the eye socket, use the bottom plane of the eyebrow to locate the top of the socket. And the bottom of the socket is usually somewhere around the halfway point from the brow to the base of the nose. Make sure to not draw the eye socket to the edge of the head or too close to the inside of the nose. The old portrait rule is the head is five eyes wide, so that means there's usually an eye width in between the eyes and another eye width from the outside of the eye to the edge of the head. Now noting the planes of the glabella and the nasal bone, plot in the upper and lower lids. 
Remembering that the inside of the eye can align to the inside edge of the eyebrow or the outer edge of the nostril wing. And the outside of the eye opening never reaches the outer edge of the eye socket. Typically, I align it to the outer arch of the eyebrow, which again follows the planes of the eye socket. Then define the upper and lower lids, noting that the planes of the upper lid nicely align to the planes of the upper eye socket. Then finally, placing in the iris and the pupil as we've already discussed. Now from the side or the profile, starting again with the eye socket. From the side, you can tell that the eye socket slopes down and in toward the cheek. Next, find the glabella and the nasal bone. Then plot the upper and lower lids in alignment to the nose. Now to the drawing. Again, start with the socket, angles down and in, then using the placement of the glabella and the nasal bridge, draw in the upper and lower eyelids. Don't force the eye too close to the nose. Leave a noticeable space. As discussed before, on average, the upper lid hangs out over the lower lid. Bottom line, everyone is slightly different. Creating a likeness means finding those individualized ratios. So map the eye against the other bones of the head and facial features to find the person you are drawing. Wait, wait, Odie, how did you get in there? Come on, you really wanna be part of this video, huh? You're right, Scully. It's time to go over the basics of light and shadow. Remember, the eye sits within the socket and the brow. Thus, the brow casts a complete shadow over the eye, mainly when the light source is directly above the head. This cast shadow fills the entire socket, and depending on the intensity of the light source, can limit all information from within. As the light source moves forward, illuminating more within the socket itself, the forms of the eye that protrude forward the most will pick up the most light, such as the upper lid of the eye. As we have already talked over, the upper lid pushes forward and out. In addition, the top plane of the lower lid will start to catch more and more direct light. Light also starts to grab the protrusion just underneath the arch of the eyebrow and above the upper lid, being that it is the rounding plane of the upper brow ridge. Just underneath the lower lid is the eye bag. This light collecting pad of fat can become more pronounced the older we get. Now let's apply some value. The three planes of the upper socket arch down from midtones to darks on both the inner and outer bookends of the eye, with the inner plane typically being the darkest. The white of the eye is rarely white in value. More often than not, it is a mid-tone caused by the cast shadow of the brow and then, of course, the upper lid. Speaking of, the upper lid casts an immediate darker shadow across its lower descending plane and the eye itself. Remember, the eye being a ball or a sphere will round away from center, showcasing a slight transition from light to shadow with the brightest values typically being in the front lower center just above the lower lid, on either side of the iris. The lower lid curving down and inward is almost always in some sort of slight shadow, again noting that the upper plane of the lower lid picks up some definite light. Last and certainly not least, typically the brightest area on the iris will be the lower center just above the lower lid. Now from the basics to some more refined nuances. In more natural overhead lighting, there are very few brighter values. The majority of the eye and the eye socket are a series of midtones and shadows. Speaking of, two of the darker shadows are the inner and outer bookends of the eye. From each of those darker ends, the eye rounds forward, picking up more and more light with it. Never use a flat, dark graphic outline when drawing the opening of the eye. Especially never use a heavy outline on the lower lid. Rather define that edge with the midtones of the eye and the iris, contrasting against the highlight of the upper plane of the lower lid. The upper lid will be the brightest on the peak of the turn, 
and then it will soften toward mid-tones on either side, notably getting darker toward the inner third. Somewhat soften the outer edges of both the pupil and the iris. Remember, the eye is wet and the soft edges will help showcase that. The upper lid overlaps the lower lid, creating a deep shadow. That along with the darker plane in between the tear duct and the glabella creates the rivets that will fasten the eye to the head and land it on the face. And please don't render individual eyelashes consistently throughout. The graphic lines will flatten out the rounding effects of the eye. Rather, try to group them together in marginally larger shapes, going along the contour of the rounding of the form. Now for the final touches, the highlights. Being that the eye is wet and acts like a window, these highlights are reflections of more direct light sources in the environment. On average, a direct light source highlight will reflect slightly into both the pupil and the iris. But depending on the angle of the light and the angle of the eye, that reflection can shift and change. In addition, the white of the eye can also pick up a little bit of highlight. Typically, that highlight is going to fall just above the up plane on the lower lid. Speaking of, that top plane of the lower lid does pick up quite a bit of highlight, particularly the more wet that it is. So don't forget those. And there you have it, some basics of the human eye. In conclusion, everyone's eyes are uniquely their own, and going over every single possible nuance might make this video about eight hours long. Thus, the tools we went over will give you a foundational awareness to see and hopefully capture all of the beautiful individualized likenesses you might encounter. And please remember, even a bad day drawing is still a great day. Good luck on those eyes. Psst, Walter, hurry, he's finally gone. Really, Walter, a salt lamp? Is that all you could find? Ugh. Anyway, I'll be brief. On behalf of the Academy, this was a mildly successful attempt to recreate the human eye. But it is far from perfect. Many lessons still needed to be learned. Perfection is the ideal. And the ideal is without the iris in the pupil. Just saying. Scully! <clears throat> Scully! Scully, please be quiet. Oh, fine. Every time, Scully. Anyway, Walter, let's go. It's time to listen to Def Leppard's classic hysteria. That'll calm me down. Toodles, everyone.